Hello, everyone. This is John Montoya. And this is John Parings. We are Infinite Banking Authorized Practitioners and hosts of the fifth edition. Episode 61, The Grocery Store Analogy. In this episode, we're going to be talking about a very special chapter in Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And in this chapter, the reason why we chose it is because, as Nelson said himself, if you understand the grocery store example, the rest of becoming your own banker is really a piece of cake. And so, John, excited to do this episode with you. Uh, let's get us started with the imagination exercise for everyone. And Nelson would say, um, we should always be in two businesses. And you've heard us say it on this podcast probably a million times. You should be in two businesses, the business that you're in, whatever you do for a living. And then the other business is the business of banking. And so that's now we're actually talking about, you know, the business of banking and how can we actually equate that to some other type of business that we use every day? We may not be actually be grocery store owners, but it's certainly something we're familiar with as we've all gone into a grocery store and see how that works. So, um, John, take us into uh, the steps of opening a grocery store. So let's kick off our analogy here and then we'll kind of go piece by piece. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you're going to start any business, uh, it does require capital. Um, but w specifically when it comes to a grocery store business, we need to secure a location, right? From there, we're going to hire employees and then we need to buy inventory for our grocery store. We need something to sell to our customers. Um, at that point, once we've capitalized our grocery business, we're going to open for business. And the goal is going to be to turn a profit. So how do we do that? We, we got to sell the can of peas is what Nelson used to really emphasize. Uh, and if, if we turn over the, the can of peas, you know, we, we have them, the customers buying the groceries and we're restocking our shelves. What's going to happen is we're going to earn a profit. We're going to have a successful business. And the more times we can uh, restock our shelves and have those canopies get sold. Well, we're going to continue to earn more profit. And that eventually leads to a good problem to have because as a successful business owner of your grocery store, what are you going to do with your profit? Well, you should reinvest it. And that will likely mean, well, you open up a new location, maybe across town or in the town uh, nearest. So the idea behind the grocery store fits very nicely with what Nelson is trying to teach us with IBC. So let's let's bring in the IBC uh, example now that we have these points that we've covered in opening our fictional grocery store. How does it relate to getting started with IBC, John? And just to wrap up the grocery store part of it, I just wanted to bring in the other thing that Nelson mentions in the book, and he kind of boils the grocery store owner the function of the grocery store owner, he kind of boils their whole job down to receiving inventory in the, in the back of the store, in the warehouse, and then there's moving that inventory to the front of the store where it can be purchased, right? So it's, a, it's an interesting thing when you think of it that way. And that's kind of how we're going to start thinking about the banking business. Um, it's the same process. You know, first we have to secure a location, right? Where is the best place if we're going to be in the banking business? you know, other than getting an actual banking charter or something. But if we're going to create an IBC banking business, you know, where's the best location to store our capital? And, you know, we talk about it all the time. We say a mutual uh, dividend paying mutual insurance company. Um, that's the, that is the foundation of what we, what we use for IBC. The second stage is we, we need to qualify and pay premiums. So, Life insurance is so powerful, you have to qualify for it, number one. And then once you can get it, you have to pay premiums. Well, who's managing that policy? Who are you paying? And who's managing the policy and helping that policy grow? And that's really the insurance company employee. So that's kind of like hiring your employees to manage this cash asset for you. You know, who, who do you call to uh, get a policy loan? Who do you call, you know, when there's a claim to be made? You know, that's what the insurance company does. So we're essentially paying them to run our uh, cash business. Um, and now that we've capitalized our uh, banking business, so now we are considered capitalized. What do we do next? We need to buy inventory. So we pay premiums um, to use the life insurance company's money via policy loans. And so 
buying inventory, you can think of using a policy loan, you're going to pay interest for that policy loan, right? So every, every time you pay interest for a policy loan, you're basically buying for the use of that dollar until you can do something with that dollar to hopefully make a profit. So when you open for business, you're capitalized, opportunities have a way of finding you, right? And so now what we do, now that we've purchased those dollars via the use of a policy loan, now we're just going to sell those dollars, right? Um, we can go buy real estate. We can do some private lending. We can start a business, right? All of those things. So we're just thinking of our every dollar in our system as inventory that we're going to buy. Uh, we're going to buy the use of it from the insurance company, just like a bank buys the use of a dollar from us when they pay us, you know, right, right now it's almost no, no interest, but the little bit of interest they do pay, they're buying, they're paying us for the use of the dollar we put there. And then they go sell that to a lender or a, excuse me, a borrower. We're going to do the same thing. Right. And then, so now that we've acquired money, um, for a little bit of money to make more money, that's called a profit. <laughs> and so what do we do with that profit? We use our profit to free up capital for reuse. So what does that mean? You know, we, we need to be honest bankers and we need to repay the loan. So if we're going to, we're going to take loans uh, from the insurance company against our cash value. We have to repay those loans and free up that capital again, right? That's that's what he meant by being an honest banker. And then what? Do, then we just rinse and repeat. Eventually, just like John was saying, when you have to uh, open a new grocery store location, eventually we'll have the capacity for so much capital that it won't all fit into a single policy. And so what do we have to do then? We have to start a new policy, hopefully, um, so that we can have make more room for the all the capital we're, we're creating here. And so, you know, your job as a capitalist is not much more than receiving, just like the grocery store, it's not much more than receiving dollars into your IBC policy, right? Your warehouse of wealth, and then moving those dollars to the front of the proverbial store so that you can sell them and, and make a profit. And so um, this is hopefully we're kind of just doing a good job comparing the two businesses uh, so that you can see that that's really what it boils down to when we want to use money, when we want to become our own banker. And I think the novel idea for me and probably for the majority of people listening to this episode is the idea that you're essentially starting a business every time you open up a new whole life policy. I grew up uh, the the son of a butcher and a grocery store cashier. So ironically, both my parents worked for the grocery store, but they worked for the grocery store. They didn't own the grocery store. And so they, they definitely had a very um, blue collar wage earner mentality. They didn't have a ownership stake in the business. And the the novel idea here with what Nelson Nash is trying to really get you to think about is owning a business that you get to participate and really be a consumer of, uh, because you're, you're all going to myself included, uh, John Perrins included, you know, everyone out there, we're, we're all going to consume. Well, as Nelson said, we should be in that business. And, and we've basically been conditioned our entire life to outsource the banking function to a traditional bank. And you really just got to, you know, call time out and realize this is something that you can actually do yourself. You can take control of the banking function. So this is a pretty novel idea that Nelson is sharing with everyone. And I think that's one of the the biggest takeaways from this chapter. Yeah, it's it's um it's really big because if if you could own the means of production for all the things that you're going to consume, imagine the value you cr you could create because by the way, it's not a one-to-one -one value. You know, when you buy something from a company, and you send money their way to buy whatever it is, um, that purchase creates a bigger value in terms of the value of the company. It's not just a, you know, if you pay $10 for a widget, the company doesn't grow by $10. You know, the company grows by more than $10 because it's now you're looking at the purchase price of that company, which is the future value. 
And so if you think about if, if all your dollars could go into a system that you had ownership of, um, imagine how much, you know, every dollar you spent would create two, three, ten dollars $10, whatever the number is, but more than $1 of value in your life. Um, that's really what we're looking at here with, with infinite banking. Absolutely. And not only that, but here's something else to consider about owning this business. Um, for the, for the people who are already business owners, let, let me just posit to you this way. When you got started in your business, whatever it is that you do, were you guaranteed to turn a profit? Well, the answer is no, right? It takes a lot of, uh, perhaps luck, skill, and guesswork in order to run a successful business, a lot of know-how. Um, when you open up a whole life policy. This is a business like Nelson would say, but here's, here's the big difference. Unlike all the other businesses that exist in the world that have no guarantees, this IBC business, it's a whole life contract, meaning you are guaranteed to have more cash value at a future date than premium paid into it. This is a business that is guaranteed to be profitable. How many people have that guarantee when they start their business? I know I didn't. So if you think about it, if you're going to get into a business and someone could guarantee you that you were going to turn a profit, raise your hand if you would want to start that business. It's a no brainer. Absolutely. And, you know, being here in Silicon Valley, you get a lot of uh, folks who, um, they have a hard time kind of wrapping their head around, um, capitalizing their life insurance policy. Meanwhile, they're, they're in the, they're in the world of venture capital, but they, for, they somehow forget about the capital part. They, they're only focused on the venture part, which is like the exciting, you know, unicorn creation, if that ends up working out for you. But guess what? Th that capital came from somewhere in order for that to happen. So it has to come somewhere from somewhere to create that in your life as well. And so Anytime we start a business, you know, we have to capitalize that business. And that's, that's exactly the same thing that happens in this banking business that we're creating, uh, using dividend paying whole life insurance. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say this just because it's guaranteed to be profitable. It doesn't mean that there's no risk of failure. Um, and, and what I mean by that is when you take a policy loan, Nelson would talk about being an honest banker. He'd also say, don't steal the peas. Well, when you take a policy loan, I always tell people, look, if you're going to take a policy loan or, um, and you know, not pay yourself back, that's the equivalent as, as if you were borrowing money from your parents and you decided not to pay them back. And so I, I, I ask people, you know, if you take a loan from your parents, are you going to stiff them? You know, are, are you going to, or are you going to pay them back? And they always say, well, yeah, of course I'll always pay them back. And my answer to them is, well, look, when you take a policy loan, you should treat it exactly the same way that, that is th those canopies that, that is a, a very precious commodity. That's, that's your own capital. And if you're not going to repay your policy loans, essentially what you're doing is you're stealing from your future self. So also in this chapter, Nelson would talk about, uh, you know, don't steal the peas. And it's really important that you all have that discipline, not only to uh, capitalize this whole life business, but also to be an honest dealer. Uh, because really the only person that uh, you're, you're going to steal from is going to be your future self. That's right. And just uh, tying that into you know, how I was kind of calling money inventory, you know, when, when he talks about don't steal the peas, you know, that's, you don't steal the peas because that's your inventory that you're using to make money. So, you know, if you're, um, you know, your significant other goes in and says, well, you know, we, we own this grocery store. So I'm going to, you know, just grab this can of peas because it's free. It's ours anyway. But what is unseen and by the way, I say significant other, it could very well be you. You know what I mean? It's like any, anyone who owns something, they kind of, they have, they have free reign over it. So sometimes it's easy to miss what damage is being created by consuming that, that 
piece of inventory. So if you, if you take a can of peas off the shelf and you eat it, well, it takes, you know, five, six, seven more cans of peas to sell just to recover the cost of that can of peas. So it's, it's not a free thing just because you paid for it. If it was there to earn money, you can't just consume it. And it's the same thing with our dollar. So what John Montoya is saying about, you know, being an honest banker, that's exactly what's happening. This is your inventory that's there to create more for you. It's there to create more wealth, more assets, more income. And every time you consume it, you're just delaying the process longer and longer and longer. Just like um, when, if you see like a compound interest curve, it's insane. Like if you interrupt that curve, by spending money in that account, it's crazy how long that delays the compounding effect. And that's happening every single day of our lives as we spend money on things um, because we're we're not strategically capitalized. 100%. And one more thing I would add too is, you know, when you're restocking your shelves, uh, putting more cans of peas on the shelves, that way you can make future purchases. Uh, you should, when you go to take these policy loans from your whole life policy, not only repay them, but repay them with market interest. Um, I, I think it, it's really intellectually dishonest to just because you can take a policy loan and then just pay back the principal and whatever interest that the life insurance company charges you. If you really want to set yourself up for the future, you should not only charge yourself a market rate, but a little bit beyond the market rate, because what's going to happen is you're going to set aside cash flow that is going to restock your shelves. I uh, repay that policy loan, but you're going to basically create this discipline of saving money that is going to have a profound effect because once that policy loan gets repaid, what you're going to have is this excess cash flow. And this is a really good problem that we all get to with the IBC process where we have to ask ourselves once loans are repaid, where should we now redirect that excess cash flow? Well, can you max out the PUA rider? Is there any room left in your IBC policy or do you have to search for a new location and open up a new grocery store, uh, i.e., is it time to start your next whole life policy? So be sure, you know, repay your policy loans, but make sure that you're also uh, paying a market rate and then some. Yeah, Nelson would uh, say it that in, in the way, you know, if you're willing to pay another bank. So if you weren't doing any of this and you needed to go to a bank to finance something, you'd be, of course, if you, you do it. So you're of course willing to pay that bank the interest rate, um, in order to access that capital. If you're willing to pay another bank, why wouldn't you be willing to pay your own bank? And so, um, all of those things that, uh, you know, John Montoya was just talking about, that's, that's, uh, the reasoning behind it. So really a ton to unpack in this two-page chapter, but uh, so important that we really take time to think about owning our own banking business and uh, just just incredibly powerful the way that Nelson helps us to relate um, the IBC banking process to opening another business, uh, which you know he calls the, the grocery store example. So uh, John... That's about all I had on this chapter. Any any other thoughts that maybe you have to share with the listeners? No, I think we can wrap it up maybe just with this final quote, you know, what kind of business do you want to be in? And John Montoya just talked about, you know, do you want to be in one that where you're taking the risk or do you want to be in one where it's guaranteed to turn a profit? And uh, Nelson said that, uh, you know, businesses come and go, but banking is eternal. And so, you know, the more we can control that banking function, the more um, control we are, you know, for all of our lives and the generations yet to come. So if you have any questions about this and you want to, if you have any questions and want to see how this could apply in your particular situation, as always, you can go to the fifth edition.com. You can uh, schedule a free, no obligation consultation with us right there. Or if you're the type of person that likes to do a lot, a lot of learning online before talking to anyone, we have an online course that you can take advantage of and get uh, tons of information in that course as well. 
So I think that's it. John, thanks a lot. This was a good one. Thank you, everyone. Take care.